Good afternoon. Last year at this time, I was in Chuuk, Micronesia. Um, I went there with an organization called World Teach, and I was my main focus was to teach high school math. So the solely cooking projects that I did were very peripheral. I don't want to misrepresent myself. But Julie told me that this is a corner of the world that has not been heard from in terms of solar cooking. So here I am to share what I learned, and I want you to bear in mind that I was on one tiny island in a country of over 600 islands. Uh, and I was in a state that is very dysfunctional, as a welfare state, and so um, you cannot extend any of my conclusions to the rest of the country at this point. So where in the world is Chuuk? Well, uh, Micronesia, a little north, northeast of Australia, is a country that spans about the same distance as from here to the Mississippi River. And it's, like I said, over 600 islands divided into four states. Chuuk is one of those states. Chuuk is home to the World War II famous Truck Lagoon, which was the place where the, uh, that turned the tide of war um, in the South Pacific. So half of the Japanese fleet is, is sunk inside this lagoon. So this particular island is the capital island of Chuuk, and I live there in a village called Nantaku. The size of the island is less than 50 square miles. So seven miles by seven miles, that's it. That was one of the larger islands in Chuuk. So let me tell you what what's going on there right now. Um, Chuuk has a district, not Chuuk, but this island has a distributed power system uh, for about a year and a half. It's not very reliable, it's diesel generated, but still most people cook on open wood fires. Um, wood is not yet a problem to get. There's plenty of it. It's a, it's a jungle um, ecology and the wood grows very fast. And because it's a welfare state, a lot of people have a lot of time on their hands to go get wood. Some people are having trouble getting enough wood on their own land, and so seek um, arrangement with, arrangements with other clans to gather wood um, a little bit further away. But, you know, the islands aren't that big. You don't have to go that far. And when I say wood fuel, this also includes coconut husks and coconut shells, which are very good wood fuels for their fires. I used two solar cookers when I was over there, a Roger Haynes solar cooker. The one that he's giving away out there is not the one I used. It was a previous model. And Jim LaJoy's all-season solar cooker. I used Roger's cookers for the first half of the year, and then Jim shipped me his. Both of them I used in the same place on a flat concrete roof uh, of the cement block building where I lived. And this building was surrounded by jungle on three sides, so we could not take advantage of the early morning and the late afternoon light. There's a picture of Roger's former cooker. The uh, pot sets in a polycarbonate sleeve that kind of suspends it in the middle of the reflective space, but you all know how that works. This is a picture of Jim LaJoy's cooker. And again, these are the positions I could not take advantage of because of the early morning shade. So what goes in the pot? Well, unfortunately, since World War II, processed white rice has become very available. Uh, and most chickies have adopted it as, as a staple. I hate to encourage cooking white rice. It's nutrient poor. Um, and it contributes to the high incidence of diabetes in Chuuk. They're, they're in the top three in the world in terms of type 2 diabetes. So this, this is not a good change in their culture. But that's what they use. And to meet them where they were, I cooked white rice dishes. And I usually combined them with other short cooking foods like the reef fish, which had to be gutted and scaled, 
and belly leaf, which grows in the jungle. And they have a, a wild green there that they call spinach. And I also uh, planted a couple gardens, so I had some cabbage that I could use as well. The taro root and the tapioca root were traditional staples. Some people still eat them. Um, of course, it's much easier to go to the market and buy a bag of rice than it is to dig those up and prepare them. And the Chukis woman cut up these roots in large chunks. They just whack them with a machete and boil them over an open fire for a couple of hours. And even after they're cooked, they're extremely dense. You still have to cut them with a knife. So they, they have really adopted the rice. They like the, the flavor of it, the ease of cooking. This is breadfruit, which also takes a lot of processing. Um, they cook that and pound it. The men have to pound it because it's, it's a lot of work. They use heavy clubs to pound it. This is the cooker that Roger's giving away now. just wanted to show you the pot arrangement. I used a pot with a solid black lid, though. In Jim's cooker, um, I tried two arrangements with the glazing. One is the double Pyrex bowl, one inverted over the other. And the other was the um, oven roasting bags inside a spherical wire frame. I definitely like the double bowl uh, arrangement better. The, I found the oven cooking bags really awkward to use and it was difficult to check the food during the cooking process. And the reason you need to check it all the time is because the weather is so changeable there. You have no idea what your food's doing. Now this chart kind of tells all. In or seven degrees above the equator, in the middle of the ocean, I thought would be a hell of a place for solar cooking. But it turns out it's, it's not very solar cooking friendly. At least not with the kind of cookers I had and with the kind of experience I had. So if you look at this cloudy line right here, three quarters of the time I was there, and I was there for 11 months, um, the cloud cover exceeded 75%. In fact, there were no clear days whatsoever during the whole time. And clear is anything up to 25% cloud cover. <laughs> uh, so it rained a lot. But th this is one of the more interesting things. Look at these annual averages for rain. They used to have a dry season of three months. Then starting around 2006, 2007, they started getting incredible rain. 357 inches in the month of February. On my birthday, it rained over 40 inches in a 24-hour period. I, can, I mean, can you even? I witnessed it, and I still can't believe it. So, <laughs> right, right. Well, you can imagine it's problematic the other way for them. Um, but you know, is this a, an extended La Nina year? Uh, year phenomenon that we're seeing here, or is it going to be a long-term climate change trend? Who knows? So right now, the I think the greatest impediment to solar cooking over there is the uncertainty on any given day that your cooking process is actually going to finish. You might have to build a fire anyway at the end of the day, and you're not going to get a meal cooked for noontime. Um, I had to teach school every day or work on water projects or whatever I was doing. So I wasn't home to focus the angle of the cooker from, from hour to hour. My most successful cooking days were on Sundays when I was home all day. But even then, I didn't necessarily get a meal completely cooked. And I, had, I uh, changed how I prepared the food. So whereas the Chukis woman were chopping things up into large chunks, I was making half-inch cubes out of the taro root and tapioca root, uh, or shredding it. Now these women are cooking for lots of people. The average household on a compound is nine people. 
So they resisted the idea of having to chop things up really small. Um, and the shredding didn't work at all. We had a few bloody knuckles from that because it's something they don't normally do. So should we continue with solar cooking in Micronesia? Definitely. There might be microclimates there that are really amenable to solar cooking. Um, keep an eye on what climate is doing and get more people there to try things out. Thank you. <laughs>